Well, super excited Hola. to have everyone here. You are joining us today for Fix or Fire, Managing Up or Managing Out Problem Reps. Before we get started, love to start with an icebreaker for our speakers. Um, today, let's do... Uh, you know what? Favorite restaurant in San Francisco. Ooh. Since you're both based here. Bridget, after you. Oh my God, me first. I can I can go for it. My favorite is Zuni. So it's an oldie but a goodie. So I'm a big fan of like coaching trees in all things. Sales team coaching trees, you know, you know the diaspora that comes out of like PTC to MongoDB to Datadog, da, 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 all that sort of thing. And a big coaching tree that I'm obsessed with is Alice Waters's coaching tree. So Alice Waters, who's the person who started um, uh, Shea Panisse, she was like one of the the people, the innovators of like farm to table and kind of like California cuisine, I want to say in the 70s. And so like her coaching tree of like all the, the the chefs who have gone through Shea Panisse is like absolutely bananas. And Zuni is one of the kind of the OG ones that is based in uh, based in San Francisco. So that's a big that's one. Zuni big, big, big Cafe one. on Market? It's the bomb. Well, it's I super dropped rad. a link for yeah. folks if anyone now else is based here. Now I have to take Bridget. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. Yeah, seriously. Um, What's okay, your favorite? You come, you come to mind. Um, I'm going to give it up for Beit Rima, um, which is a few mm. locations, but it's Arabic soul food or Arabic comfort food, one of the two. Mm. Um, the location I frequent most is um, in Coal Valley, literally right when you get off the Cole and Carl stop on Muni. Um, it's You walk straight into Beit Rima. You should love go. It. It's great. So for, for folks who are coming to visit San Francisco, maybe for people who well, next time they come to Dreamforce, they can they can make a make a plan to go to Zuni and, and Bait Rima. Seems like the, yes. the move there, huh? I love totally. that. I'm grabbing the link to Bait Rima too. One second. Mm -hmm. I want everyone to have access to this. Um, I'm just going to go for the sake of it. Um, I love Picaro in the mission. Um, food's like pretty good um but it's like tapa style and there's like pictures mm. of sangria and it's like such a good like friend restaurant big groups good vibes mm -hmm. um, good use case that. yes exactly so it's like i'm more in for the environment versus mm -hmm. the more in it for the environment versus the food but it's amazing mm. regardless and who doesn't love sangria so anyways going to get started today. We're here to talk about fix or fire, managing up or managing out problem reps with the amazing mm -hmm. Pete Kazanji and Bridget Seicard. 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 Okay. I was like, wait, I've never said Bridget's name out loud. Seicard. <laughs> um, we're so excited about this amazing C. content <laughs> and takeaways uh, you'll get out of this event. So before we get started, just a couple of things. Um, today's event is brought to you by the Modern Sales Pros team. For those of you not familiar, Modern Sales Pros is the largest and highest quality community for those in sales management, leadership, sales and revenues operations, sales enablement, also known as our Modern Sales Pros. MSP's mission is to create an environment for members to thrive and answer and get answers to questions they'd otherwise struggle to solve on their own. Help them see around corners they may not know about. MSP does all this through live sessions like what you're about to experience today, an online forum, quarterly summits, and we're just starting to get back to in-person events. If you were able to join our Dreamforce event in September, wow, that was incredible. Um, like 1,500 people signed up and 500 people joined us live. It was amazing. I think both Bridget and Pete <laughs> can attest to that. Turns out people like uh, people like people like their other uh, awesome, you know, awesome peers. And they also like uh, food and booze. <laughs> Weird. <laughs> yes, totally. Um, and then that being said, we also have MSP's next summit coming up. Um, the next summit is RevX Fest. We're calling it the virtual festival for sales nerds. I'm going to drop a link in the chat. But speakers at this are absolutely nuts. David Sachs, Craft Ventures is speak of Craft Ventures is speaking. Nick Meta, the CEO at Gainsight. Manny Medina, the CEO at Outreach. Um, Eileen Lee, the investor that coined the term unicorn. Like, just the lineup is absolutely incredible. Um, so don't wait. Go sign up for that right this second. And just a couple more housekeeping notes. So. Um, 
First of all, this event is being recorded. You'll be able to access the recording and key takeaways on the events page of the Modern Sales Pros website in just a couple of hours after the event. And if you have any questions for our panelists, please use the Q&A function and we'll be sure to get to them during the live event. Now, let's get these panelists introduced and our sponsor. Pete, I'm gonna pass it over to you to tell us a little bit about Atrium, introduce yourself and Bridget, and then get started with the content. Killer, thanks, Han. Um, yeah, so so I'm Pete Kazanji. I'm one of the founders and uh, CRO of Atrium. So Atrium makes uh, data-driven sales management software. It's software that helps sales managers, sales leaders, and reps use metrics to improve performance. And uh, one of the things that's like super fantastic about Atrium is that it, it only takes a couple minutes to set up uh, set up a free account. You just sign in with your um, your uh, read-only access to your Salesforce uh, CRM, and presto changeo, you uh, within a few minutes have a world-class harness of uh, world-class analytics harness, and that'll show you how all of your reps are performing across hundreds of metrics. So that's a little bit on on Atrium there. Um, wanted to um, introduce um, my. So what we're going to be talking about today is, um, you know, kind of a, a, a fun spicy. Uh, spicy topic, which is uh, rep performance management. And specific, like this is an important component of data-driven sales management. Um, it's not the whole the whole thing, um, but it's a really important component of it. And, and essentially what that means is, is taking, you know, uh, finding areas where reps are having, you know, ha having challenges where reps are underperforming and either A, you know, glowing them up, getting them to success or calling it a day and saying, hey, this person's not going to be a fit here. We really need to, to move things along and, and move this person out. Um, and we're going to be talking about how you can do that. Um, we're going to be talking about how you can do that in a way that's fair, data-driven, um, and ideally you know, solve these problems. But in the, in the situation where it doesn't, you can be effective in, in moving out the, the folks who are not going to be successful in your organization. Um, so a little bit on... Um, a uh, little bit on me and then also Bridget. Um, so uh, I'm Pete Kazanj. I'm one of the founders of, of Atrium. We make, as I noted earlier, data-driven sales management software. Um, prior to Atrium, I started a recruiting software company called Talentbin um, in around 2010. Uh, I was acquired by Monster Worldwide in 2014. And so during that, that time, I really went from being a business generalist founder um, with a product marketing and a product management background to our first sales rep, our first sales manager, our first, uh, you know, our first sales leader. And then when we were acquired by Monster Worldwide, I was responsible for new product sales um, for a, a 600 person sales organization at Monster. So a um, little bit of a, a different kind of experience in both of those situations. Subsequent to that, wrote a book on startup sales called uh, Founding Sales, um, pictured right there. And then also started our modern sales pros uh, community. Um, and so enough about me. We happen to be joined today by uh, Atrium's illustrious director of customer success, Bridget Seacard. Bridget, you want to share a little bit about like what you spend your time on right now at uh, here at Atrium and kind of like what you did before? Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Pete. Um, hi, everybody. My name is Bridget. It's great to be on with you live today. Um, and to share a little bit about what I was doing before Atrium um, was actually a sales operations. So I Weird. was, <laughs> yeah. Um, so I joined Atrium in February, 2020. Um, what a time to be alive, uh, right, right <laughs> after a few years in sales ops. And I joined Atrium to work in CS because I was like, wow, this product would be really, really great for somebody like me in sales ops. <laughs> um, and that has proven to be true over the past almost three years now. Um, so now I'm running the customer success team. Um, our big focuses are, of course, performance management for our reps and also helping our customers um, with performance management, which starts, of course, with understanding um, all the metrics and all the performance behaviors that need to be scaled or corrected or what have you, um, or coached, I should say. Um, but some other stuff that's going on with us is we're, we're multi-threading, we're doing QBRs, uh, we're closing renewals. Um, and we're setting up new customers and implementations. So if you're an Atrium customer, hello. Uh, thanks for partnering with us. And if you're not, uh, hopefully one day you will be. I, and if you, and yeah, and if you're not one of the 
one of the most compelling reasons to be an atrium customer is getting to work with our customer success team because like let's be honest they slap they're fantastic <laughs> <laughs> um awesome well i'm really excited because bridget and her team work with the nearly 300 customers that we have today and she is just an absolute 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 wealth of um of knowledge with respect to data-driven sales management. Um, before we get started here, there's a couple of things, kind of offers that we have on um, on tap here for attendees. Um, one of the things that we found when, when working with our customers is Atrium exists to help managers and leaders and, and also reps use, uh, use metrics and data to improve their performance. Um, one of the things that we found is that there's there's a pretty big deficit when it comes to enabling managers just to manage, right? And kind of teaching managers. So oftentimes managers are AE promotions, SDR promotions. And unfortunately, like most of the enablement resources go straight to the, the reps. And, and there's kind of a deficit in helping managers like be, be better managers. And so one of the things that we do is we actually partner with a, a fine gentleman named Richard Harris to do monthly um uh, sales management boot camps. Uh, they're a virtual. It's a half day boot camp. It's it's done virtually. It's all on Atrium. Um, you know, it's 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 uh it's, it's paid for by Atrium. If, you, if this is something that you're interested, potentially interested in um in doing, um, we're gonna go ahead and drop a link here. Um, you know, it's typically something like this would typically cost like a thousand dollars. In in this case, it's on us. Um, all we ask in exchange is for folks to take a quick disco conversation with our uh, a lovely AE from our Atrium sales team. So that's the first thing. And then the second um, offer that we have on deck here today is um, a set of resources for folks to be better managers. So like this is training, and then these are assets. Um, one of my favorite books on the topic is Five Secrets of the Sales Coach, um, and then also, which is a you know a very fun read. It's a very quick read. It's written as a narrative, and then of course Michelle Vazana's uh, Crushing Quota, um, and and you know this wouldn't be complete without a nice uh, atrium coffees for coaches Yeti because that's really what we're talking about is being amazing performance coaches here because that's the business that we're in and using metrics that do that better. Um, so if folks are interested in getting um getting a couple of copies of these book this book and also one of these lovely uh coffees for coaches coaches yetis again we're going to go ahead and drop that link in the chat here and you're welcome to sign up for that again all we ask is um you know in exchange for that is a quick disco conversation with one of our account executives so um that's going to be that so let's talk about performance management um and so one of the big things that I want to just like put on the table here is that, you know, managing rep performance issues, whether it's SDRs or AEs or, you know, fill in the blank, um, it's not something that people, you know, necessarily relish and it's not necessarily something that people are like you're used to or good at and it's uncomfortable, but it's extremely, extremely important. And we're going to talk about why it's so important and the opportunity costs associated with that. Most of the time, this is kind of the thing that we see, right? Um, generally speaking, you should be, your job as a manager is to make your reps more performant. And that means tackling performance problems. Um, but, you know, some, some, for whatever reason, things just constantly like keep coming back in the, you know, uh, get in the way of that. And so what we're going to talk about today is why this is so important and why you should be doing this and then talk about a couple methodologies by which to make it a lot better. Um, so, so these are some of the top, some of the reasons why you want to be, um, you know, you want to be mindful of these things. So first and foremost, um, what, what you want to be wary of is, is AEs that don't cover their own costs. And this could be also SDRs as, as well. And so an important thing to kind of like think about here is what's known as, oftentimes people hear the term unit economics, right? And so at the end of the day, an AEs and, and, and other revenue, AEs, SDRs, and other revenue professionals, they're here to bring in revenue. Um, in the case of SDRs, they're here to generate pipeline. In the case of AEs, they're here to bring in, you know, bring in bookies. But imagine you have a situation where an account executive, you know, maybe costs you 150K OTE a year. That's, a, that's 13K a month. And so if they're bringing in less cash than that, um, than 13K a month, they're literally burning cash, right? And and so moreover, the, the, the thing is, is that, um, 
they're not not only are they not supposed to be burning cash, they're actually supposed to be delivering what's known as contribution margin on top of that. So say, you know, a typical mid-market account executive quota might be anywhere between 40 or 50 or 60K of bookings a month in order to not only offset this right here, but then add additional contribution margin to the business to pay for, you know, engineering expense or pay for real estate or, you know, fill in the blank. And so if this isn't happening right here, that's a real substantial problem, right? Because then your organization is upside down. And, and another thing that's important there is like, maybe actually you probably shouldn't be hiring more account executives because it see, feels that if you don't have a situation where AEs are covering their own nut and then moreover bringing in other addition, like bringing in additional revenue on top of that, well, it seems like there might be a problem with your go-to-market or there might be a problem where the product isn't fitting the market um, or what have you, because like this is, you know, this is the market kind of telling you something there. Um, the second thing to kind of think about, and like this is a pretty extreme example because ideally you wouldn't be having this situation. Um, I think Bridget, when, you know, I think this ends up being a lot more common than what we would, you know, that you would think to anticipate, like we work with a lot, a lot, a lot of customers. And when we look, when we look at their bookings data with them to kind of help them understand from a goal standpoint, um, you know, sometimes you do see this, especially in a ramp scenario, um, you know, what do you say, or like what kind of keeps people from addressing um, this sort of issue, would you say, given the fact that it like could be pretty obvious on its face, like that someone's not, not getting it done from a booking standpoint? Yeah, I mean, I think there's a lot of reasons that people, uh, managers, I should say, avoid these addressing this problem head on with their reps. Um, and I think, you know, it, it has a lot to do with like the context of uh, of the manager where they're at in their career. I mean, I know um, I've been managing for over a year now, but it definitely took a lot of time yeah. to experience <laughs> yep. um, and trying it <laughs> over and over again and maybe not doing so well at first. Um but yeah, I think a lot of a lot of managers that we work with across our customers, um, you know, they could be five, 10, 15 years in, they could be two days in, um, but it never really gets uh, less uncomfortable, but it, it does get easier with experience um, because I think, you know, people don't, managers don't want to demotivate their reps. They want to do the opposite. Um, so it's kind of just about finding the thing that um, finding the linchpin that that might motivate that rep to, you know, perform at their best and kind of pick up their game, throw down, um, rather than just, you know, demotivate them to give up. Yeah. But there's a fine line to walk there for sure. Yeah, I think one of my fa favorite uh, Bridget Seacardisms is what were we talking about the other day? Um, there's like, there's being experienced, right? I want to get more experience before I do X, Y, Z. Oh. Some, it, some, some action. And, and, and then there's, there's like, yeah, you have to do that. I think <laughs> that there's, experience. there's people saying, <laughs> saying, I would, I want to be more comfortable doing X, right? right. Like, Excuse me. And it's about actually you, you want to be more experienced doing X. And in order to be more experienced, you need to have experiences with X. Do it. No. <laughs> do that. Do, take, do the action, which we'll talk about a little bit more here in a second around like what the actions are that we would, you know, that, that people should be, should, people should be doing here. Um, so the, the second problem that people have to really be mindful of, like this is a pretty extreme example. The other kind of like less subtle, or sorry, more subtle, like less obvious um, uh, situation is when lower performers who are underperforming are stealing other people's at bats. And, and the reason, like, so this is an example right here. This is a screenshot of an Atrium um, KPI card from, from some organization, uh, you know, uh, anonymized customer organization. And you can actually see some pretty substantial variability in the win rates of these different account executives right here. And so the, the thing that is, the reality is, is that you've got a, a set amount of like lead generation capacity. Right. There's a certain number of like Google searches that are happening. There's a certain amount of like inbound leads that marketing is able to generate. There's a certain number of there's a certain amount of opportunities that are that SDRs are able to generate, what have you. And so if you don't have right, if, if those opportunities are going to people who can't convert them, who have lower win rates, well, that's something to be mindful of because those opportunities being fed to 
a higher performing rep or a higher performing set of reps would then convert in a, in a, at a much higher clip. And it's not just a problem, right? It's like not just a bummer for these individuals right here who maybe only convert their ops at a 5% clip or a 10% clip, you know, 10% win rate, like only closing one out of 10 ops or one out of 20 ops. It's also a bummer for the business, right? It's a bummer for not, it's a bummer for these other reps right here, because until people are fully saturated from a you know, time and day capacity, right? Like, you know, like they literally have no more space on their calendar. In general, account executives would, would like to have more customer meetings, who would like to, like to have more first meetings. And so by, by not managing up or managing out folks who are low conversion, you're not just not doing them a favor, you're also not doing these folks a favor right here, and you're also kind of robbing that opportunity cost from, from, the, from the business. Bridget, when you guys um, work with organizations, um, do, are people oftentimes surprised by the, like, the variability in win rates between, between their reps? Yes. <laughs> yes, they are. Um, it ends up being like more shocking than you would anticipate. <laughs> yes. Not only that, but also um, not just their reps compared to each other over, you know, this quarter, but also one reps uh, win rate this quarter versus last quarter. There can be some inconsistencies over time, which also is, is a um, concerning thing to look back on. Right. So, um, yeah, but there's there's generally with this visibility um, surprises and it can yeah. it can definitely be jarring at first, but it's the first step to like coaching to the problems that are actually happening. Yeah. And the good news is I, I actually do. I, we see this a, a lot because as I noted earlier, like it takes five minutes to set up an atrium account. And one of the, one of the really kind of neat things about our sales motion that our account executives really love is that they sell on other people, like on our, on our prospects data, which is like really fun, right? Like you, it's like kind of a, you know, it's like a Sherlock Holmes uh, investigation where you like jump in there trying to figure out like, okay, well, like what are your biggest problems right now? Well, you know, I'm concerned about Bobby. All right, well, like you should be concerned about Bobby because, you know, his win rate is really low. So you were you were right to be concerned. I bet, you know, did you know that it was his win rate? No, I didn't. I just knew that he wasn't like performing from an output standpoint. Okay, great. Now let's figure out what's driving that low win rate. Oh, look at this. He's like wildly overloaded. He has way too many ops and his untouched op counts are bananas great let that's very fixable let's fix that right or, or or alternatively oh you know his conversion rate out of proposal is really really bad as compared to other people seems like he's progressing things down the pipe that actually aren't ready to get down there um and so those are the like the first i don't know the the, the joke like the first step on the road to recovery is like admitting that you have a problem um, that's kind of, that's kind of the situation here, right? It's like admitting that you've got a problem. And, but like, once we, once we know that we have a problem and, and kind of the genre of the problem in question, well, guess what? We can tackle that, right? Like we put a name on it. We're, we know that we're able to tackle it and we can go on our merry way. And if we're like, once we're tackling it, right. Versus avoiding it, um, uh, once we're tackling it, we we know that we can manage in the right direction and if it doesn't if it doesn't recover that's okay like we've put in the effort rather than being you know an ostrich with a head in the, our head in the sand um the other thing to kind of note here is and this is something that um that i think a lot of people don't appreciate is uh, especially like maybe you're thinking about like you know, if you're a sales operations person or maybe you're a very data-driven leader one of the things that we talk a lot about at, here at atrium because we do data-driven sales management, which is different than like well, like analytics, the things that like are being measured and managed and improved here are are people, right? And people are emotional and they react to other people and they you know there's there's all, like as as my um as my brother used to say when he was a when he was a little kid people are squishy, <laughs> people are messy, um and it's true and so the another thing that you have to be mindful about is that you know, like under performance, it's not just isolated to an individual, right? It, it can be contagious, right? Like, I mean, we're all, we're all fans, fans of memes, right? Like that, that self-propagate in the world. Well, like under performance and also by conversely overperformance can also be, like is also contagious because 
there's all sorts of, you know, if, if you have individuals, an individual on your team who's underperforming and you're going to like, and, and like not bringing their, like bringing their best game, you like, it's going to invite other folks within the organization to kind of think about like, Hey, like why, like, why am I putting my, you know, why am I put like, why am I putting my nose to the grindstone? Why am I throwing down in a, in a meaningful way if this other person isn't? Uh, and, you know, in sales, you might say, well, I, everybody's compensated individually and like, you know, there's commission and there's, you know, this variable compensation. You'd be shocked. You'd be shocked. Like even in the situation like that, like if you have an environment of underperformance, like literally what you have to do is your outperformers literally have to be like, stick their fingers in their ears and be like, la, 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 la. You know, I'm not listening to that. And then moreover, the the challenge that you might have, I love that like that we have this like uh, Frozen theme going on here because my five-year-old is just like absolutely obsessed with, uh, with Frozen. Um, like you're also going to chase your high performers out of the organization because like nobody wants to be on a team with a bunch of scrubs. Right. And so this is another this is a, a really underappreciated situation where not like the toleration of underperformance not only can invite the deterioration of performance from other folks, it also will help your higher performers out the door there. Bridget, um, is this something that you guys frequently see in, mm -hmm. uh, you know, in your cust in the customer base? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, um, we are really, we every day are speaking with customers who um, are encountering something like this because on most sales teams, AEs, SDRs, CSMs, there's going to be um, folks who are not as, not giving as much effort and Atrium helps you actually see that. So for example, um, one manager I've worked with uh, was kind of living in fear of addressing an issue much mm -hmm. like Anna, right, where he was like, I don't want to be seen as a micromanager on my team. But at the same time, he was already getting comments from other people on the team mm -hmm. kind of like, hey, um, yep. I feel demotivated, right? Yep. And so it, it was like very, um, you know, it was jarring because it was like, wow, I'm not the only person that notices this. And that's the price of mm -hmm. visibility, right, is like, mm -hmm. everybody can see this. And so um, it holds the manager more accountable to address it. Um, and so when manager gave that feedback in a one-on-one, -on -one, just said, hey, we got to get emails up, um, that that person didn't listen, put them on a PIP, gave them a weekly email goal that they set in, uh, in Atrium. Person did it, but was sandbagging it for later in the week. Um, and that's when the manager had to get a little bit micro and to make it a daily goal, right? Um, yep. to, and that's where the rep failed. So... Um, that person ended up being managed out, but uh, the rest of the team was able to see that, hey, the manager addressed it, which kind of restored faith in the manager and also reinforced that we got to behave like Elsa, not Anna, right? <laughs> to keep, <laughs> keep your activity levels up. Otherwise, uh, you know, just because somebody else is underperforming, the precedent is that it will get addressed and that person will be managed up or out. Um, I love that story. I, I feel bad for Anna here. I feel that this should be Olaf. I think what I'm going to do is I'm going <laughs> to, I'm going to come back through here and make this Olaf because like, it's okay to make fun of Olaf. My, I think my son would be like, would have a meltdown if you knew that we were, we were, uh, <laughs> if, if, if Anna was underperforming here. Anna um, would never do that. <laughs> Anna would never do that. Right. Anna would never do that. Come on. She's, she's, she's always like running around trying to save Elsa. Um, that's a fantastic story. Thank you very much for that, Bridget. I mean, I think like, I think that's a really good point because one of the things that like, I mean, I'll, I'll kind of cop to this myself, um, an, as a, as a manager and as a leader, um, by the time you're like, by the time you're seeking to address it yourself, I guarantee you that your reps are already thinking about it and sorry, and talking about it. Right. They're talking about it on like on the group chat. <laughs> right. They're like, hey, what's going on with like exactly what Bridget said? Hey, what's going on with Bob? Right. Or like, what's going on with Anna? And like, geez, Louise, why like, why is this not being like, why is Pete not handling this? Does he not care about us? Does he, you know, like 
those things are going through everybody else's head, and which is why it's, as a manager and as a leader, it's so, so, so important to address that because you, you definitely, definitely, definitely don't want Elsa going out the door, right? Which actually I think is a lyric from Frozen. Um, cool. So so the, the, the fourth thing that you really have to be mindful of, I, I think there is a there is a lyric about going out the door. Um, Love is an open door is the there song. There you go. Yes. Oh, oh, yeah. There you go. But, that, yeah, yeah. Anywho. Yes. Performance management is an open door. Um, so number four here um, that you really have to be mindful about is like as you're hiring, this is kind of a variant of this one right here. As you're hiring um, new folks, you want to bring those folks into an environment of performance and success because they're showing up and like they're not 100% sure exactly like what the deal is in this organization. And so if they come into an organization and see, you know, a tolerance for, for underperformance and they see like there isn't a performance management culture, um, then, you know, like it's going to take all the more personal motivation and effort in order to hit the you know hit the cover off the ball there and this is something that we see quite a bit uh, a really kind of key use case for atrium is uh what we call ramping instrumentation i actually do uh, a master class on what we call data-driven ramp management um, and paying attention to those leading indicators in ramp ends up being a really really important thing um, but the way that you ensure that people are highly motivated, they're hitting the ground running, is that they they see that there's a high performance and high, uh, and kind of quick ramp of reps who came before them, um, and they like jump on that train. It's like you know they they jump on the water slide and they're like zoom off to the races there. And if you don't have that going on, it's going to be even tougher to to do that. Um, the the last thing that I'm going to kind of touch on here that's a little bit like geekier this is something that like your cfo your ceo founder your board will care about here um is is what we like to call broken numbers um and so if you think about the performance of your organization um the that like the performance of your organization and, and like you know uh, arr growth um you know how much bookings is being added etc cetera, etc cetera, all of that is um, all of that. Then it, that that is a summation of the performance of the individuals on your team. And so, if you don't have, like, to kind of use this example up here, if you have underperformance on the part of a slice of your team, what that's going to do is that's going to dilute the perform, like the organizational performance, right? Like the, the metaphor I like to use there is kind of like pouring cold water in a hot bath situation. Um, and so how that, like, that's not just a problem from an individual standpoint, but it's also a problem from a aggregate standpoint where if you have underperformance on these individuals, you're gonna see things like higher cost of sales, right? So I mean, because individual reps will be driving less bookings on a per on, like these individual reps right here will be driving less bookings on a per rep basis which you know as related to their their salary expense their base salary expense um they won't be driving as much bookings as compared to like the cost of marketing to generate those leads all of that then leads to a higher of co higher cost of sales a more capital of intensive business right so um, the business doesn't throw off money as quickly as um, as other businesses, and so that's going to make it less attractive to um, to investors, which then will lead to a lower valuation or you know challenges in actually executing on fundraising. And so to kind of give examples of what this might look like in practice here, uh, this is actually a slide from another presentation that I do. Um, on um, on ramping of sales or scaling of sales organizations, excuse me. And so the difference between very crisply ramping cohorts of reps um, where you have, you know, you hire four new reps, you get them to success within a certain amount of time um, and, and, you're on, and then you go and hire another cohort of reps as compared to a longer uh, ramp period here, you can see after 36 months with the faster ramping cohorts you get to 
1.6 million dollars in monthly contribution margin whereas if you have fewer cohorts because they take eight months to rent the eight months to rent before you add a new a new cohort well now you're only at 800k per month of of contribution margin so doing really good performance performance management a getting people and this is where you know ramping is really important data-driven um rep ramp management ends up being really important but if you aren't managing that proactively you're going to end up more on this trajectory here than you are on this trajectory with the the kind of the fundraising and the business valuation implications associated um therewith um i actually kind of jumped past this bridget um on the on the ramping side of things um mm -hmm. obviously this is a really really critical thing that um you know for our customers i think they're very very focused on making sure that their aes are ramping into uh ramping in band their sdrs are ramping into in a band, um, what do you kind of see as like the biggest challenges for folks in um, like A, being mindful of how people are ramping or not, and then B, um, addressing situations where, where folks are ramping poorly? Yeah, great question. Okay, so I think that there's, I think that lack of awareness around a rep's ramp on a manager's part is an issue, but I also think or, and I think it's an issue for the rep themselves because when you start, sure. um, when a when a rep starts at working, you know, on a revenue team at a startup or tech company, that's when they're most malleable. That's generally when sure. they're most stoked on feedback, when they want to know if they're doing things right, you know, and mm -hmm. especially when you get those high performers, like they aren't high performers yet. They're just super anxious and like really want to make sure that they're doing a good thing or the right thing. Because uh, for revenue generating teams, generally SDRs, AEs, CSMs, they're not creating ops for a couple of months. They're training or they're not closing business for a few, you know, few to several months. They're training and then they're doing their best at their at bats or CSMs, you know, are at the mercy of their customers' renewal dates. So point being, um, visibility into ramp is super, super helpful for the manager to know what do I need to do to help this person get up to speed as quickly as possible. But it's also huge for the rep for expectation setting and for letting them know, hey, hey, high performer, like you're doing a really good job. Like you're attending the right number of meetings to shadow. You are sending um, the right number of follow up emails on behalf of the CSM you're shadowing, right? Like you are in band with high performers that came before you look at you track so well, um, you know, with them um, or, and, th and that gives them a lot of um, that, that at least on my team has been really helpful for people who are high performers and super stoked yeah. to be joining. Um, yeah. And then of course, for those who are not, it's like, Hey, you know, you're down here. Typically people are right here and they're in terms of their effort or efficiency metrics right now. Um, what should we, what, let's talk about what we can do to get you where you need to be. And then, you know, that's generally also really helpful for them to have that visibility and give them kind of a, a North star to shoot for. So that's been really helpful for people on my team. Yeah. I think that's a really good point. Cause it's like, oftentimes people are like, people don't get into management to kind of, you know, be grumpy <laughs> or like be a, like be like, like, to make the to make their reps like their their reps feel bad or um and and oftentimes what ends up happening is people think that it's like that that being um hands on from a performance management standpoint or like or or transparent about this stuff it like they're afraid it's going to hurt people's feelings and so then they shy away from it but a way to kind of think about it is it's it's like it's not fair to the staff Right. It's like not fair to the individuals themselves. Like we had this, you know, an issue like this recently with somebody on our team who had like they were a career switcher who were moving into a revenue role. Um, and it was a hypothesis. It was a hypothesis as to whether or not they were, um, you know, that like a customer facing role, which, of course, like what does customer facing roles involve? Talking to lot, lots and lots and lots and lots of customers, talking to prospects, talking to, you know, talking to customers, having lots and lots and lots of meetings, sending lots and lots and lots of emails, constantly being like doing activity, being able to like switch context, switch, et cetera, et cetera. It was a hypothesis that that person was going to be able to do that. And so, and they weren't doing it in spite of all the like enablement and, and support. And, and so it's not fair to them 
right? Because like, you know, we only get to be on God's green earth for so long. It's not fair to someone to, um, you know, to look the other way and pretend that they're having success when, when they're not right. And, and like, ideally what you would, what you'd seek to do is you seek to coach them up and train them up. But like, if that's not working, it's, it's still not fair to them to have them, you know, continuing to like twist in the wind when they could be moving into another role, maybe in the organization, maybe another organization that's going to be a way more, a uh, way better fit for them. That's aligns with the things that they like to do, or maybe they're like, you know, more naturally gifted at. Um, and so what I would challenge people to, to do here is rather than saying to themselves like, oh, I, I you know, I don't want to have a performance management conversation with this person. Um, and actually we do, we have these fun little cheat sheets here around how to do performance. Like this is a making data-driven sales performance conversations easy. It's a nice little checklist. Um, rather than telling yourself a story that it's like people are not going to be like your reps are not going to be happy about that. Um, it's actually, you know, like it's unfair not to have those conversations with them. Um, cool. And so um, what, so like, that, that's the reason why all that stuff matters. And so the, the, the thing that we're going to kind of like change gears here and talk about ways of addressing this, um, you know, ways of, of like doing this, like tools to do better performance management. And so really the, the big thing there is that data and metrics is the best way to identify performance issues. Um, you can't argue with data. You can helps you see around corners. Um, it allows you to see whether or not things are getting better. All these sort of things. It, it removes, you know, it removes opinions. It's objective, and so, um, of course, the way that we think about this here at Atrium, and we'll, this is going to be a quick commercial for for Atrium, is that doing data driven sales management is the right way of doing this. It's the right way of like managing a modern sales organization in general. Um, and so one of the reasons why we built it, Atrium was because we believe that sales managers, AE managers, SDR managers, AM, CSM managers deserve their like dedicated software to help them be better at this, which involves every KPI you could possibly want for your SDRs, AEs, AM, CSMs, but then also the monitoring and instrumentation thereof. So you know, being able to track progress towards goals and achievement or not thereof, um, statistical anal analysis and on various metrics in order to help with early warning alerting, and then also root cause analysis. And so, you know, in short, Atrium exists to help those sales managers, leaders, and reps use data to improve team performance. And we do this for hundreds and hundreds of, of modern sales uh, organizations that are lucky enough to work with Bridget and her team. Um, so cool. So how do we deal with these, these performance issues? So we're going to kind of talk about some, some mechanisms by which to address this. Um, first, these are some kind of ways to do this. Um, one, a really th a big thing that we focus on here at Atrium internally, but then also we coach our customers on, is that you have to make space for this to happen. A, a joke we t say internally is that um, uh, that calendar is destiny. And so if you don't have time on your calendar for feedback and performance conversation, coaching conversations, you're you, like you're not you're you're gonna <laughs> you're you're gonna be more prone to have this sort of situation going on. Like, oh, things keep intervening. Things keep intervening. Well, not if you have specific time on the calendar as a forcing function there. And of course, the great place for this is the one-on-one. -on -one. Um, the second thing that you want to do is you want to set clear expectations about levels of performance. A great way of doing this is with goals. Um, organizations oftentimes do this from an output standpoint, whether it's a bookings quota or it's an opportunity creation quota on the part for SDRs, but having specific, like expect clear expectations with respect to levels of performance is a great way of getting ahead of these sort of things. Um, next, you need to be, make sure that you're inspecting your data and metrics to detect these issues and uh, to detect and diagnose these issues. And then the last thing is, is that you need to be, uh, you know, be willing to have those conversations, make a plan to remediate things and then loop back. Um, I'm a huge fan uh, like on that last part around like dr having conversations, making a plan and then looping back again to verify that that's happened. Um, this is something that Corey, uh, Corey Bray and Hillman Sorry talk about quite a bit in Five Secrets of the Sales Coach. Actually, coach right here is an acronym. I forget what it, forget what it stands for. Um, but to essentially to, to do just that. I highly, highly recommend that book. And again, maybe we can drop um, a link for folks to sign up for that, that book and the, the Yeti if they'd want. So then the next thing is, okay, let's talk about having time on your calendar. Yep, calendar is destiny, no lie. Um, 
these are some of the ways, like kind of the places in an operating rhythm where you might have opportunities for coaching and feedback. Pipeline reviews are great, um, but it's deal centric. Um, and so what we like to do is we advocate that folks break apart um, their, their kind of coaching situation or like coaching opportunities for deal strategy sessions versus one-on-one -on -one meetings. And the deal strategy is to fo focus on top deals and do coaching there. Um, on that help help kind of reps navigate through the uh the issues in question um and then the one-on-one -on -one is not for deal review the one-on-one -on -one specifically is for reviewing metrics talking about those coaching initiatives looping back on the issues in, that have been identified previously and that are being managed um qbrs are a great way of doing this on a more um um on like a longer term um, cadence, I guess. It's like one-on-ones are every other week. Maybe they're weekly, maybe they're every other week, and you're working on a certain set of things that you're coaching with the rep. The QBRs are going to say, hey, okay, let's take a breath. Let's look back over the last quarter. Let's see where we had success. We'll see where we had improvement areas. Let's set an intention for the thing that we're going to um, we're gonna fix in the coming quarter. Um, and and then that then flows into that, that next set of one-on-one -on -one meetings there. Um, Bridget, when you when you work with uh with customers, what are the, the kind of the biggest ways that you recommend folks um kind of use this concept of calendar as destiny to to drive better performance in their teams? Yeah, absolutely. Um I think that calendar is something that we're all living in. Um to some extent. If you're in, in customer facing, you're gonna be in that multiple times a day. And it's super underutilized, you know, um, and, and it's uh, something that when you leverage it to its fullest poten potential, um, it's not only destiny, it's like, you know, behavioral changes that actually come out of it. So, for example, one um, one manager I was working with was uh, had a, a, a rep on a PIP and there was a few tenants of the PIP that the you know rep needed to uh, to execute on. Um, the manager wanted to do their diligence and say, hey, like, I'm here to help you. I want to, you know, not only check with you, in with you on your progress a couple of times a week, I'm actually going to put time on your calendar um, every day for the things that you need to be focusing on in order to succeed in this PIP. So um, not only was it like calendar invites that were on that rep's calendar to <laughs> block time for those things, um, but it was also like links in the in the invites to the resources that that rep would need in order to yep. succeed on the PIP. So maybe that's links to like sales off sequences or, um, you know, Salesforce reports or whatever they need. Um, mm -hmm. So that, that I think is like one little anecdote around how to leverage it in a way that actually guides the rep toward the behaviors that they should be prioritizing and focusing on. I love that. Yeah. And that, that's something that um, Corey and Hillman talk about a bunch in five secrets of the sales coach is the like what's the actual plan and then how, like what are the specific actions that are going to be taken because it's one thing to kind of be like hey look like you have a pipeline hygiene problem um i know this because your untouched ops counts are are kind of heinous why don't you go ahead and fix that well i mean we might tell ourselves a story like oh okay well like they should figure it out on their own okay but like why would you make it hard Right. Like that's, that's your job as a manager is like, hey, we're going to make this easy for you. Here's a hyperlink to an atrium op view here. It's all of your, you know, it's it's all of your ops that haven't been touched in the trailing 30 days. And here's this one here that like of all of your ops that don't have a meeting on the calendar in the future. We're going to hyperlink this in this calendar invite here. There's one on Tuesday morning from, you know, from nine to 10. And there's one from Thursday morning from nine to 10. And there's, these are just going to repeat on your calendar until we get this untouched opportunities count, get this stubborn untouched opportunities count down to where it should be. Right. And if we, and if you're not able to adhere to that after I kind of gave you a, a, you know, a yellow brick road to walk along, right. well, you know, maybe this isn't for you. <laughs> yeah. And it's like, you know, if you're afraid of micromanaging uh, or being perceived that way, then, um, you know, explaining that like Pete just did and being very explicit about why are we putting these things on your calendar? It's because we want this to be as frictionless as possible because I want you to succeed. Frictionless. I love that as, as like the, the, the phrase here. Um, cool. So let's go ahead and talk about setting clear expectations about performance. Uh, so a really, really great way of doing this is just, just set goals. Just set goals. It's not hard, right? And and importantly, set goals on leading indicators. It's it's one thing to say, hey, you know what? We should have, you know, we should do 400k of bookings, you know, 
uh, in a quarter or like, you know, 200K of bookings in a quarter. Okay, cool. But like, how many customer facing meetings should AEs be having on a weekly basis in order to get to that? How many new opportunities now need to come into their pipe on a monthly basis in order to make sure that they're going to be able to get that? What should their win rate look like on a quarterly basis in order to do that? If you just set out some, like, if you don't map those out, then attaining this, like, you know, big hairy goal of 200K of bookings in a quarter or, you know, 600K of bookings in a year is, is going to feel insurmountable. But breaking it down into these these leading indicators and then goaling on it will make it such that on a weekly basis, on a monthly basis, you're seeing how you're tracking to success there. And get really granular, right? Like one of the things that I joke about on with AEs is that the, you know, the, the, the fundamental unit of selling is the customer facing meeting, right? So, so measuring that on a weekly basis for your account executives is completely reasonable, <laughs> completely reasonable, right? Do you want to have multiple weeks in a row where you like look back and be like, oh, wow, so-and-so had three, me three customer facing meetings last week, the week before and the week before that, that sounds terrible. Right. That, that's like that's a lost month. And guess what? There's only 12 months in the quarter. So getting really kind of crisp on the setting goals on those leading indicators is a very powerful thing. Same with SDRs. Right. Um, SDRs you know, having more goals on a weekly basis because the cadence is a little bit faster ends up being um, kind of more important. But again, don't be don't be afraid about getting really granular and really proactive around AE, um, AE goals. It's only going to make them more successful and like it's going to allow them to self-manage in a better capacity, right? Like they can bird dog their own metrics, say, hey, here I am on a Wednesday and oh my goodness, I didn't realize that I'm behind from a meetings on the calendar standpoint or a touches on op standpoint. I guess I should block some time. I'll block the first half of tomorrow to do pipe gen and pipe, you know, pipe hygiene maintenance to touch all my, like touch all my ops because I know that I'm tracking behind on my goals for this week. Um, Bridget, I know that actually setting goals ends up being um, kind of the implement, uh, the impl part of the implementation process here at Atrium or the Atrium University process um, here. What are the kind of the numbers of goals that you guys end up recommending folks folks end up um, starting out with? Uh, that's a good question, Pete. Um, I think that having goals on like your top five metrics is probably mm -hmm. a good round number to start with. And you can mm -hmm. have um, two goals on a metric, two, three goals on a metric if you want. Like it could be, hey, you know, we want you to have 20 meetings a month. And that means you should be having five meetings a week. Right. So we have sure. two goals set on that for different timeframes. Yep, um, totally. I think that starting simple, starting with the metrics that you're obsessed with and really sure about is great. And then as you become more data driven, as you understand your motion better, you will naturally want to add more goals. Um, that's definitely what's happened to me as I've uh, grown into my management role and understanding our CX motion more. Um, so starting a little bit smaller with those things that you're just obsessed with and maybe need to report on up to your leadership team or to the board. Yeah. Um, I, yeah, we, and I do a master class on what is it like setting and managing with goals that don't suck. Um, mm -hmm. And I think that like the, the idea of kind of like easing your way into the jacuzzi ends up kind of being a good, <clears throat> a good approach there. Um, so the third thing here that is important ends up being inspection of those key metrics, right? So you can't, um, if you're not looking at the data, it's not something that you're, that you're going to be able where you're going to be able to catch these issues and so what that means is either having you know crm reporting and dashboarding or bi set up uh, you know unfortunately this requires kind of the construction of this we like to say that you know data-driven sales management software ends up being something that is very helpful here because it's like ready to go out of the box and and does all that monitoring for you but however you're going to slice this you know how are you going to uh, approach this um you know, making sure that you're bird dogging this information ends up being really important. And so what you want to end up doing is looking for situations where somebody's underperforming as compared to their peers or looking for situations where somebody's um, like trend line is deteriorating down. Um, if you can do that statistically by having something that like monitors this for you, that can be all the more powerful there. Um, we actually have these, these laminates that we like to send to folks that allow you to do the diagnosis 
of those issues. So like, it's one thing to understand that somebody has got a bookings problem, but then going upstream to kind of figure out what is the root cause? Like, is it, is it because they don't have enough wins is it because their ASP is too low is it because their win rate is off. So kind of doing that diagnosis is the way that you're going to be able to figure out what the root cause is and then tackle that. And then the fourth thing that we want to talk about here is like making sure that you're actually driving those conversations. Um, so couple ways of, of addressing this. And again, we have that um, you know, data-driven uh, performance management cheat sheet here, kind of desk reference that folks can have. But importantly, you want to be very frequent with your, you know, with your feedback. Make, not only are you doing it frequently, but you're doing kind of immediately after you observe a behavior. You want to open with positivity, reiterate the reason for the feedback and the coaching, kind of like what Bridget was saying earlier. Hey, your untouched, this untouched opportunity situation here is problematic because it's going to negatively impact your win rate. That's why we're doing, and, and like a low win rate is going to make it such that you don't hit your bookings goals. And if you don't hit your bookings goals, you're not going to be able to pay off those student loans or you're not gonna be able to like buy that house or whatever it is that kind of like personally matters to that rep. Um, document the issue in question, like we were talking about, untouched opportunity situation, figure out like, hey, what might be driving this and then propose a solution to that. Um, again, the way to, the best way to deal with these sort of things is in the one-on-one. -on -one. That's like why you wanna have, have it on the calendar. Um, we recommend using a, like a coaching template there so you make sure that you're documenting what's happening there and coming back to it on a recurring basis. Hey, we've got this pipeline hygiene problem. We're gonna come back in two weeks. You're gonna be doing these things right here that we put on the calendar. And then literally we're gonna look at this metric. Like we're gonna hyperlink off to, I don't know, an atrium report or a Salesforce report and say this, this untouched opportunities report right here better be under five, under five or we're gonna be having an uncomfortable conversation. Um, making sure, and then when, when folks are not, like when that's not actually sticking, that's the point at which you, uh, you, you may progress to a performance improvement plan. The important thing though, is that if you're being very consistent in feedback, um, um, performance feedback, you probably shouldn't have to get to a formal performance plan situation. Um, usually a performance improvement plan is an indicator that like you haven't been being consistent in your feedback enough. And we see this a lot here at Atrium, like not all of our reps work out, um, but oftentimes what ends up happening is people see like the writing on the wall way ahead of time before it's time to get to a, a formal performance plan because like they've seen the leading indicators of, um, you know, they've seen the leading indicators and they kind of know where they're at where, as compared to where they should be. Um, and so, you know, we actually have a performance improvement plan template that we can drop here into the into the chat um, for folks to be able to reference. Um, but but you know if if you're doing a good job of like doing frequent performance management in your one on ones, you probably won't be progressing to this. And then lastly, um, you know, make sure that you're properly evaluating um, like where kind of performance shortfalls might be coming from and when you're thinking about who might have to, you know, if you need to offboard somebody from the, from the organization, um, a great framework there is, is it a will issue or is it a skill issue? So will would be like a level of activity. Are they willing to put in the effort? Are they able to govern themselves and make sure that they're, you know, they're being focused and they're working on the things that need to be worked on? Or is it a skill issue where, you know, they're, they're struggling with discovery questions or they're struggling with X, Y, Z. Usually skill issues can be fixed will issues are, are a little bit more difficult to fix. Um, so first, when you're looking at things, look for reps who have both will and skill issues, because usually that's like kind of the toughest thing to, to, to fix. When you have folks who have will deficits, as indicated by like low activity metrics, that ends up being, you know, obviously it's something that you, you could seek to address and you probably should and, and, and you know, front and center the, the shortfalls there. Oftentimes it's the biggest problem to solve or sorry, a, a stickier problem to solve is just like that core motivation um, and willingness to like put in the calories. Skill shortfalls, on the other hand, just means there needs to be more coaching and, and you know, you'll be more successful if you do that. So um, that's all the content that we had to, you know, what we have for today. Again, folks, what I would recommend is like, if this sounds interesting to you and you want to get better at, you know, uh, performance management and sales management, we do have our complimentary half day virtual boot camp, sales management boot camp that we sponsor with Richard Harris. Normally it would be a thousand dollar cost um, for folks. 
it's complimentary. Atrium pays for it. Um, all we ask for in exchange is a, um, a quick disco conversation with our team. We're going to go ahead and grab, uh, drop a link to that. And then moreover, if you're interested in getting a copy of Five Secrets of a Sales Coach, which I can't recommend highly enough, and then Crushing Quota by Michelle Vazana, um, and then a Coffees for Coaches mug um, here from, from Atrium. Again, just go ahead and sign up in the link that we're going to drop here. Um, wonderful. So I think we just barely, barely made it under time. This was uh, fun because it was the first time that we've uh, we've done this content before. Bridget, did you survive? Yeah, I'm still here. So barely. Thanks. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. Hey guys, apologies for the the technical back and forth, but I'm here. Um, wanted to thank everyone so much for coming to today's session. Appreciate you all. Thank you for Pete and Bridget. For to pre for presenting this fixer fire, managing up or managing out problem reps, recording and slides will be shared post event and see you all next time. Thank